Hello, everyone. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm going to play this video and talk about things that are going on to better explain what's going on and talk about things that I think that are being done right and or done wrong. I have already done a review on this particular officer involved shooting. This video is a follow up to that incident. The agency has uh, published footage from where they reviewed the incident themselves and so this is the agency reviewing that incident and giving commentary to what was going on more information about it I believe there's some more photographs from that incident that are being shown in this versus what was in the previous uh, critical incident briefing type video so since this presentation is um, 47 minutes long from them I'm not going to be able to play the whole thing and then go back <laughs> and and start talking about things um, from there so I may or may not pause intermittently here and there to expound upon things and talk about other things all right here we go Call this meeting to order. It's uh, June 8th, 2023, 101. Reference to RTR 22-0007. And we will introduce all the board members starting to my left. Lieutenant Brian Healy, Commanding <coughs> Officer over Major Case Narcotics. Assistant Chief Ed Cayenne, over Narcotics Advice. Director Brian Key, Personnel and Professional Staff. Lieutenant Mark Crawford, Commanding Officer of Professional Motors, I guess. Chief Chris Brown, Professional Standards. Our Academy Gun Range. Chris Chappell, Trinity Academy, Gun Range. Sergeant Chris Ray, Training Academy Sergeant. Gabby Young, Office of General Counsel. Thanks. Uh, Lieutenant Mark Crawford will be the floor leader, and he will be responsible for explaining the hearing process and initiating questions for the testifying member. Thank you, sir. If I can have all testifying members, please stand behind the table, please. If you would, please raise your right hand. Please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Thank you. Have each of you signed the appropriate forms? Thank you. You can have a seat. I'll now read the confidentiality notice. Based on the current state of the law, these proceedings are considered confidential are not subject to disclosure until they become public record. Therefore, anyone participating in these proceedings is prohibited from willfully dis disclosing any information obtained during this process, including the nature of the questions asked, any information revealed, or documents furnished in connection with these proceedings until they have become public record. The purpose of the Response to Resistance Review Board the Response to Resistance Review Board conducts administrative reviews of incidents involving certain uses of force by members of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. These reviews are conducted to ensure adherence to agency policy and training. Consistent with state and federal law, the Sheriff's Office affords substantial deference for the instantaneous judgment and decision-making that must be used by law enforcement officers in certain situations. However, this deference does not permit any member to depart from agency policy, training, or the professional standards of reasonableness. Since the ability to use force is such an extraordinary license given to law enforcement officers, the public looks to the Sheriff's Office to monitor and regulate these uses of force. At today's hearing, this board will assess the appropriateness of the actions of all involved members based on the facts. Okay, I just want to back up real quick. Let me rewind a few seconds here monitor and regulate these uses of force the public looks force is such an extraordinary standards of reasonableness All right since the ability to use force is such an extraordinary license given to law enforcement officers so <laughs> unless they have some weird wording in their state law that gives some kind of extra powers to law enforcement as far as I know, the same use of force laws that law enforcement 
fall under, the citizens also fall under too. So in a way, you could like that's weird wording. That's almost like saying uh, the ability to use such force uh, is such an extraordinarily license given to citizens. I, I wouldn't imagine he would say that. Um, but it, it just stuck out to me. Um, as far as I know, every state's uh, use of force laws are are the same for everyone. For regular cis, non-sworn law enforcement officers, reg, just regular citizens, and for sworn law enforcement officers, you follow the same damn laws. Now, there are case laws from Supreme Court that kind of give guidance into certain things because law enforcement are getting into more unique incidents where use of force is used. Uh, let's say, for example, Tennessee versus Gardner. Um, that kind of case law says that law enforcement are legally permitted to use deadly physical force to stop a person fleeing if they are a substantial risk to the rest of the public. Meaning, if there was an active killer somewhere at a school or something like that, law enforcement comes across them and they're running away with a gun in their hand, just running away, law enforcement would be justified to use deadly physical force to shoot that person in the back to save other people's lives. Now, do citizens fall under that kind of case law? Generally, no. Um, because citizens, just regular citizens, are not having a duty to act. They're not having to go after um, active killers and stuff like that. So, because of that, it just hasn't come across any court where something like that has happened and the family have tried to sue a private citizen. I, I would argue that a private citizen would have the same rights as law enforcement to use deadly physical force to stop a person who is a substantial risk to the public by shooting them to stop them. But anyway, kind of getting off on a rant there. All right, moving on. The public looks to the sheriff's office to monitor and regulate these uses of force. At today's hearing, this board will assess the appropriateness of the actions of all involved members based on the facts and circumstances known to each member at the time of his decision to use force. Uh, in this situation, we will not need to invoke the Right in Detective Oliver. Have you prepared testimony for this hearing? Okay. Please proceed, sir. This is case number 2022 231 900 on Thursday, April 21st, 2022 at 10 a.m. Yes, then occurred. This is actually for the Kilo 3 subsector. Our involved officer of officer ID controls on date of employment body one camera was issued on here to him on okay on 421 2022 at zero 355, the Dexter River Sheriff's Office responded to an alleged attempted murdery. That case control number is 2022-230989. Upon arrival, police spoke with the complainant to advise he heard a noise at all the windows of his residence. He informed the police that he looked out of the surveillance camera and observed his Kevin Mahan in his yard. He said shortly after seeing Kevin Mahan on the on the camera system, the system became inoperable. I went outside and learned the cables and wires to his camera system and the internet had been cut. 
officers on scene explained to that based on the fact that the camera system did not capture Kevin Hahn, actually cutting the cable and the wires, they were unable to arrest him. Officers also explained that there was no evidence of an attempted burglary to the residence. Following scenes, officers made contact with Kevin Mahan. At this time, Kevin Mahan provided information to the police about where he resides. The police confirmed the information provided to them. The police then instructed to go to the state attorney's office to obtain a restraining order. At 11.23, dispatch received an armed dispute call of uh, a complaint against a man uh, against a bottom of school. If the suspect was armed with a uh, arm the bottom and on now. Officer advised he would take the call since he was in the area. Officer arrives and he meets with the complainant and begins to document the alleged damage. While on scene, officer makes contact with the parents of Kevin Mahan, Lee and Kathy Mahan. As officer speaking with Lee and Kathy Mahan, the suspect returns to the property. At this time, officer makes contact with the suspect Mahan near the wood line. Officer observes a black and yellow axe and the suspect Mahan and the suspect Mahan's right hand. He gave four about four loud verbal commands for suspect Mahan to drop the axe. Suspect Mahan then raises the axe in a threatening manner towards officer. Officer then fires one shot from his duty weapon, striking suspect Mahan in the head. These are our dispatch calls. Our first call comes in at 11.16.59. Calls 911 and the suspect is and return to the property. Can I see? Yeah, not. Is a house, apartment, trailer? I'm sorry? Is a house, apartment, or trailer? A, ha a house. How can I help you? I've got someone on my property. It's, uh, he just came over just early this morning and tried to break in my house. And he's, he's down. Now. He's back. And he's agitated, and I've got a gun. You have a gun in your hand now, or you just have a gun in your home? i got a gun in my hand right now. Are you going to shoot your If he comes in here. Does he have any weapons? I don't know. He cut my he cut my power cord, or my uh, cable and my security system last night. Are you white, black, or Hispanic, sir? White. What color shirt and pants are you wearing? Uh, white pants and gray shirt. Oh, sorry. Great white white shirt and gray pants. Hush baby, hush baby. Go with Nana. This is your. Yep. Is he white, black, or Hispanic? White. What is he wearing? I don't know. He's outside. Orange shirt and long pants. Orange shirt and long pants. Is he outside? Yes. He was just right in my yard. You said you tried to get into your home last night? Yes, I called the police and they didn't do anything about it. At 11.52, dispatch device, she's holding an arm to dispute. The complaint on a gun versus a known male. Units are in Kilo 34 holding the zero and 63. Complainant signal zero with the gun, whiskey mic, wearing a white shirt, gray pants, versus no mail, whiskey mic, orange shirt, outside at 1020. Please stack the zero and 63 on more to book units. Thirty-three shots fired. We're the next slide after this will be the camera footage of the BWC footage of this. We want to remind you there's a buffer on the camera that's pre-recording 30 seconds before the camera's turned on. And the camera
know, as I say, it was a little time. It could be four to five hours. I know different from us based on where we're not where they like to save us time. Ten thirty three shots fired. Start me a rescue for a whiskey mic. Signal eighteen to the head. I'm seventy seven for now. Uh, no police were shot. Suspect is down. Ten more the shots fired for police or suspect. Shots were fired by police. You all right? I'm good. What I want to do in here is show you as the progression of the axe is getting worse as officer disengaging him. If you notice right here, the axe is right at this point when he's telling them, you notice that this slide is continuing to go up. Right here, now he has the axe above his head, and in this particular slide, the axe is coming back, and the angle is if he can throw it off. This is the time you also see the smoke from the gun at this time, and so we had that in the position to throw it off the side, now making the decision to shoot. You can see the smoke coming from the fire itself. This is an aerial view of the actual shooting. This land is roughly about 10 acres uh, that's land that's owned by them. The information that Kevin Hahn is providing to the police on the previous call is for this house. Right here, you can see the house. Uh, the actual shooting happens in this wood line right here. And from the next slide, you will see off the car coming to the property on this dirt road. Right here. And for our reference point, this is Firestone Road. This is the north, and then this is the cross street before that. This is the entrance to the dirt road coming into the property from Morris Avenue. As you see here, this is where Officer is at the time when he's attempting to generate the reports when he's learning from his partner, Officer Casey, that the suspect is back on the property. So. As you will see, he's going to come here, come over here to this area, about right here where he's standing with the shooting place. This is the scene of after the actual shooting with the suspect in the wood line. This is the actual axle hatchet that he has at the construction room. This is the show casings from officer. We have here's a witness statement from Officer from Lee Mahan, who's a father, Kevin Mahan. He, Lee Mahan is the father of the suspect, 71 year old white male. Lee receives a call from his father, and Kevin was on his property attempting to access the residence through a window. He told him that Kevin had cut the, the lines for the cameras and the internet services. As Lee and his wife, Catherine, responded to. He stated it took, uh, took them approximately 10 to 15 minutes to locate Kevin after they arrived on the property. After locating Kevin on the property, Lee and Kathy spoke with him for approximately 60 minutes. During that conversation, Kevin, then the conversation with Kevin, he, Kevin told his mother,
happy that he had taken meth and was having illusions come true. He said Kevin left them at the approximately zero seventeen and went back to take a shower. He said Kevin was arrested on twelve six of two thousand one and had been clean since he had since he was released from jail. Kevin had been dealing with drug issues for a long time, but he appeared normal until March of 2022. He said Kevin had issues with meth and fentanyl. He said Kevin left his residence on Saturday, 4 16, 2022, at approximately 12 30, and they had not seen or heard from him prior to receiving a call from. <clears throat> then we spoke with. <laughs> who was a caller, he's a Kevin, white male, 42 years old. Originally called the police at 0400 when this Kevin came onto his property. He said Kevin tried to break into the house and cut their wires so as cables to his, his video cameras and internet. He said the police also told him he needed to obtain a restraining order and there was nothing they could do. Called the state attorney's office about the restraining order and he was told he could not obtain one because he did not have a police report. Called the police again at 11 19. Kevin came back to onto his property. He said officer arrived and was handling the situation when Kevin walked up. Grabbed his trio door and went inside his residence. He was only inside for a few minutes when he heard one gunshot. He said he came back outside and the suspects followed him on and said he shot him. This is our suspect, Kevin Lee Mahan, white male. 43 years old. He has been arrested eight times and had four felony convictions. All right, let's let's back that one up. <laughs> All right, so uh, from 1998 to 2013, arrested eight times, uh, four felony charges and four misdemeanor charges, armed robbery with a deadly weapon, felony fleeing. And attempted to elude police, resisting officer without violence, possession of less than 20 grams of cannabis, retail theft, DUI, possession of weapon or ammunition by convicted felon, uh, four felony convictions. Hmm. Um. So they don't mention about anything past the year 2013. Um, but they had said something about he had gotten out of jail and was um, clean or something so maybe they were talking about 2013 or something I, I don't know um, I find it a little peculiar that um, he went from 2013 to 2022 uh, without any new arrests and he's, mess and he's and he's messing around with meth and fentanyl um, the arrest uh, that he got in 2013 I don't know what that was for um, that could have been the retail theft or something I don't know if it was the more excuse me if it was the more serious thing of armed robbery then um, I would imagine that the time frame that he could have got for that could have been a long while and let's say you know he could have got 15 years out of it it is not likely at all that he got 15 years um obviously right since you know that kind of time frame right there would mean that he wouldn't obviously be out uh but that that charge could carry something like 15 years and um a lot of times um prosecutors will do a, a plea deal they'll uh, they'll amend charges down they'll say if you plead guilty uh, we'll kick these out and then you keep this one um, and uh, you know you'll do something like serve 20 percent uh, you'll serve five percent of your sentence whatever and then um, you know you do some classes in prison you can get out early that's pretty common um, but let's say you know 2013 he did have the armed robbery which I don't know if he did or not um, if the court had fully prosecuted him on that and gave him the maximum sentence I would say it would probably be likely that he would not have been out 
of prison to be able to do this thing. And he would not have been shot by the police and he would not have victimized the people that he victimized. Hypothetically speaking, like I said, I don't know what he got in 2013. This is the axe hatchet that was recovered from the scene. What we did just to confirm that this was the weapon that he had during the time of the shooting, we sent the blood samples off to Gaffield Lee. Gaffield Lee confirmed that the blood on there and the DNA on the hatchet did come back to Catamaran. We have here is also duty weapon, which is this JSO issue Glock 17 9 millimeter uh, in it. And a magazine that contained 16 rounds plus one round in the chamber, one spent show case and recovered. His ammunition count was consistent with a fully loaded magazine. All ammunition consistent with the JSO issued by duty rounds. So, well, of course, as soon as I go to pause it. Show case and recovered. His ammunition count was consistent with a fully loaded magazine. All ammunition consistent with the JSO issued by duty rounds. All right, so a Glock 17, his magazine contains 16 rounds plus one in the chamber. One spent so one spent shell casing recovered. Okay, it's hard to read that with all the captions um, showing up at the bottom. At, at first, I thought it was something else, but never mind. Moving on. Actually, I'll, I'll come back to this. So, um, there are some people who will load their magazine up, and this this particular gun holds seventeen, or the magazine holds seventeen rounds. There are some people out there who will load their magazine to seventeen, insert it into the gun, rack the slide, and then be done with it. That's not a, a, a good idea, in my opinion. Um, I believe that you should get as many rounds as possible. And once you fully load your magazine, insert it in the gun, rack the slide, I think you should eject the magazine and put a round back into the magazine. That way you have a fully loaded magazine plus one in the chamber now at the end of the day is that one round going to make that big of a difference you never know probably not but you never know if you have the means to carry more ammo carry it this is our pharaoh of the actual shooting this measures our Distance of fire is a digital recording system that we use at the scenes, and this is measuring our distance at approximately 29 feet from where Officer S was standing. And our guesstimate this is like looking at his body when he was standing somewhere in this area gives us approximately 29 feet between him and the suspect at the time that he discharged with. The findings from the autopsy report. Revealed that Kevin died from a penetrating gunshot wound in the head. The cause of death was a gunshot wound in the manner of death was homicide. The toxicology section of the report <coughs> said he had marijuana and methamphetamine in his system at the time that he was shot. This is our letter from the state attorney's office. Our office has completed this review of the death investigation at Kevin Mahan. Conducted by the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. It is our legal opinion that the shooting of Kevin Mahan was justified on a pitiful for law. We need to find and close this copy of our report that outlines the strange reasons for our opinion. Thank you, sir. So, the State Attorney's Office, that is a completely separate entity. Completely separate. So, you know, some people are like, oh, the police investigate themselves and, you know, they find nothing wrong, blah, 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 blah. 
Well, in this particular case, and in other many cases, obviously, um, there is a review of the incident by a whole other entity. Not just a, a law enforcement entity. So you may have a, a city agency or even a sheriff agency that has a state police entity that investigates the incident. But at the end of the day, whatever county this occurred in, that county um, attorney, district attorney, whatever well, the terminology is uh, for the states, those people are going to review it as well. And they are a completely separate entity. So there's more than one entity looking into these incidents. If you could, if you can go back to the slide about the suspect's criminal history, can you repeat that? <laughs> One more time, please. If you could repeat that. Okay. Since this criminal history, he was from 1998 to 2013, federal arrested eight times, four felony charges and four misdemeanor charges. His charges consisted of armed robbery with a deadly weapon, felony fleeing, and attempted to elude police, resisting officer without odds times two, possession of less than 20 grams of cannabis, reach out of death, DUI charges with damage to personal property and possession of a weapon by ammunition by and he has four felony convictions. Thank you, sir. Uh, if I could direct your attention to Officer <laughs> statement. Yes, um, Officer <laughs> stated that Officer Kaysen stated he saw the suspect making his way towards the complainant's home. Yes. Did you verify that statement to be accurate and true? Yes, from sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That was verified through Officer Kaysen's part of Thank you, sir. The officer that we see on the video, the detective uh, that was behind a uh, shooting officer, was he there and to witness the actual shooting? No, sir. He walked up after. Okay. No questions. Um, so, 11 16 I'm guessing that was the second call for service of the complainant, Mr. who was the Kevin, correct? Yes, sir. Was there any other previous calls for service regarding? Uh, Kevin Muhammad, this property. The Jacksonville Sheriff's Office responded to that location five times from September of 2021 to December of 2021. One of the calls for service, Mr. Muhammad had an ax cutting trees out on the property. Okay, so when Mr. called the police twice, he also called Kevin Mahan's dad to basically alert him that his son was on the property and dad basically told him to stay away from him because if he's under the influence of drugs, it can be dangerous. That's correct. No further questions. Uh, any questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Please introduce yourself to Morgan. Both with the, um, the initial dispute. 
She stated that the suspect, Jed Mahan, had come onto her property. She stated that he was acting erratic, that he was shaking a fence like a wild animal, and that he was talking to himself, and at one point jumped the fence. She knew the suspect, the head of Mahan, because she was acquainted with the suspect's mother, Kathy Mahan. While on the scene, speaking with her, uh, Kathy Mahan came to the address and I spoke with her regarding her son. She stated that he was abusing illegal narcotics and that he had done some damage to the property where they had allowed her son to stay at. Uh, I advised her that Due to him damaging the property, the eviction might be appropriate. And I was also concerned about the suspect, and I uh, made the family aware of Marchman Act resources where the suspect could get help for his son's abuse. Kathy Mahan uh, advised me that they uh, attempted this process, but that process, that they gave up on that process after the suspect was arrested. I then conducted a simple search database to try to determine the suspect's criminal history. I observed felony arrest for armed robbery, for possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. I observed uh, various narcotic related arrests for DUI. I also observed a charge for resisting an officer without violence. After conducting that search, um, I observed that there was a armed dispute pending across the street. Myself and Officer Payson then went over to that scene where we met with the second complainant, Mr. Mr. Uh, continued to tell me about the incident that transpired at around 0 4 o'clock that morning. He walked me around the house and he showed me where the suspect destroyed a window and he showed me where various wires were severed. The wires running to electricity and the wires running to his surveillance cameras. Mr. Uh, showed me still images of the suspect approaching the house uh, moments before the feed was on the cameras was cut. He knows the suspect to be his While on scene, I observed about what the what Mr. described about a thousand dollars worth of damage. Since there was about a thousand dollars worth of damage, I request the crime scene detective to respond to photograph the damage done. Because a thousand dollars becomes a After observing the damage done to Mr. property, I uh, read the call notes from the incident that transmitted fire at around 04 that morning. I'm watching the clock on around. So the initial call for service happened around 04 o'clock. I was not very good. So I went and I read the call notes and I was uh, made aware that the implant Mr. called uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office dispatchers and advised them that he was willing to shoot his. While on scene, I began writing my report and waiting for the crime scene detective to respond. While I was writing the report, I was made aware that the suspect had returned to the property. I immediately radioed radio for Officer Kaysen to respond back to the scene. I then made my way back down the dirt driveway that led to the back out to Morse Avenue, where I met with Officer Kaysen. There, Officer Case advised me that he saw the suspect heading through the woods in the general action direction of I made a hasty plan with Officer Case and advised him to try to keep eyes on the suspect while I attempted to go back down the dirt road in my patrol vehicle and intercept the suspect before there's a violent confrontation between him. While driving down that road, I observed the suspect walking in the wood line towards At that time, I exited my patrol vehicle. And as I approached the suspect on foot, I observed that the suspect had a hatchet in his hand and was carrying it at his side. I gave a series of four loud commands to put the hatchet down and to drop the axe. The suspect ignored my repeated commands and raised the axe over his head aggressive and threatening posture. When he did this, he made eye contact. He cocked his wrist back and brought his axe close to his head. He maintained eye contact with me. And based off of my experience in edge weapons, I was instantly here for my life 
and the threat posed by the armed suspect. I determined that uh, my backdrop was safe and there was no immediate person behind the blue line where the suspect was located and fired one shot from the service weapon. And I observed the suspect fall to the ground. I approached the suspect um, based off of my medical and my triage training that I received most law enforcement and military. I determined the suspect was deceased, or I believe the suspect was deceased. I instantly radioed for rescue to respond. And then I coordinated with responding units and held the uh, security of the scene until I was removed um, from the scene and escorted off. When you fired your firearm, did you intentionally fire your weapon? Yes, sir, I did. Did your weapon not function at any time during the system? No, sir, it did not. Go back to you writing the report for the attempted burglary. Yes, sir. Where were you when you were writing the report for the attempted burglary? I was adjacent to When I became aware that the suspect had returned to the property, I believe that he was closer to this area over here where the suspect is. I believe this is where um, the father said he was shot. So I believe him to be in this area right here. So. At that time, I got back onto this dirt driveway and I approached Morris Avenue where I met with Officer Case. And that's where Officer Case and observed the suspect getting back this way. Did you or any other officer, to your knowledge, contact the suspect and tell him to return to the victim's residence or the, uh, return to the property? No, sir, not during the course. Uh, we, not to my knowledge, officer case did not contact the suspect and request him, hey, come back to the scene. Tell me again about meeting with officer case on the establishment of your plan when officer case had a vision on the suspect. Yes, sir. So we met here. Officer case advised that he saw the suspect headed to the wood line. We made a, a very hasty plan because. I was very worried that the suspect was going to approach and there was going to be a violent confrontation between uh, being armed. I did not know the suspect was armed at the time, but I was worried about a, a So there's a big sense of urgency. And so I made it to be, and I advised officer cases to try to keep eyes on him while I went around to try to intercept the suspect before he approached Hindsight, I probably should have given Officer Case more instructions, but what I intended for him to do was to contain the suspect in this area and prevent him from going back on Morse Avenue. So if Officer Case would follow him through this wood line right here, and then I would see go down this dirt uh, driveway. In an ideal situation, we would have made an L shape, um, keeping the suspect from uh, and then preventing him from going back out to the 63. And first initially saw the suspect on the wood line, could you clearly see both of the suspect's hands? No, sir, I could not. I had to exit my patrol vehicle and get a little bit closer to begin the discrimination process. So any movement that you made at that location was to increase your your scanning ability to see what you're dealing with as a law enforcement officer, is that accurate? Yes, sir. And at the time, I had probable cause to arrest the suspect for the criminal vandalism. Are you familiar with the barricaded suspect policies of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office? Yes, sir. What is the barricaded suspect policy of the JSR? The suspect has a position of tactical advantage. Other assets can be called in to respond to that situation without putting, um, not to, so that we don't have to put ourselves in unnecessary danger. So SWAT and canine uh, assets can be called in to uh, respond and deal with the barricaded suspect suspect in that situation has a position of advantage. When you closed the distance to the suspect to the point that you saw he was armed, did he meet the policy-driven criteria for being a barricaded suspect? I do not believe, sir. I'm going to read from our policy on a barricaded suspect. Not all subjects or suspects who refuse to surrender are considered barricaded. Barricaded subjects or suspects are defined as persons who officers believe to be armed. 
are believed to be to have been involved in a criminal act and or are a threat to the lives and safety of citizens or others citizens or officers excuse me are in a position of advantage affording cover and concealment or are contained in an open area and the approach of officers could precipitate an adverse reaction by the suspect the last and final point would be refuse to submit to arrest or surrender uh, knowing that policy to that depth uh, do you believe that uh, the suspect met the criteria for being a barricaded suspect at that moment in time? I counted the suspect at the edge of the wood line, so I don't think that he had an extensive advantage because he was not that far into the woods. And um, even if he had, based off the prior life matrix and the fact that I believe that he posed an imminent threat to the household, I felt it appropriate to make my approach for the suspect. So your intention, uh, and I don't want to put your words in your mouth, I just want to restate this so I fully understand. Your intention was that uh, barricaded suspect policy was not applicable due to the safety priority matrix being applied. Is that accurate? That is, that is accurate. suspect would have complied, would you have shot him? Yes, sir, I would not have The suspect had not raised the axe in a threatening manner towards you. Would you have shot him? Yes, sir. Officer, you mentioned that you've had experience with edge weapons. Can you explain this one? Yes, sir. So, in uh, 2013, I attended my first International Life and Tomahawk Growing uh, Championship, that's the World Championship. Um, I won a World Championship title in knife throwing, and again, it's I competed in knife throwing competitions all over the U.S. I have taught at seminars, and conferences, and competitions in Florida, California, Pennsylvania, and Texas. I practice Ali, Filipino martial arts system, um, which has a heavy emphasis on edge weapon. Stick fighting. I have taken two advanced edge weapons courses taught here at JSO. And I have run uh, response and resistance uh, scenarios where I've been both the officer and the suspect in those scenarios. How did that experience impact your decision on this day? It did. So I'm having uh, trained with edge weapons, I'm very well aware of the reactive reactionary gap, which means that within 21 and 25 feet, the suspect can reach me in about a second and a half. In this case, quicker if he were to throw it. My experience with um, throwing allowed me to recognize certain body mechanics that indicated the throw was imminent. The first being that the suspect caught his wrist back. He caught his wrist back in a fashion that would allow him to uh, throw and use the wrist to propel the edge weapon. The suspect also, when he reared the hatchet back, pointed his elbow in my general direction. So when you're throwing a hatchet, you want to throw it in an up and down fashion. You rear it off to the side, and you rear the, your hand away from your head, and you flare your elbow. The hatchet will start to spin in the x axis, and it's no longer an accurate throw. So, what the suspect did was he was preparing to throw it in an up and down linear fashion. Um, and, uh, that is what caused me to be in immediate fear for my life as I believe the, the, the throw was in. You said that if he had complied, you would not have shot. What, what, does comply mean to you? You told him to drop the knife. If he had dropped the knife, is that complying? Yes, sir. That would be a form of compliance as if he had disarmed himself. The decision you made to approach him, obviously you could have decided not to approach him. Why was that not an option for you? Because I was afraid that he would go to the events. So there's Mr. and I was afraid that Mr to finish whatever he started and when he tried to break into their house and he severed their cameras. So I believe that they were um, in a position of vulnerability and I was worried that having been confronted by law enforcement, he might try to make a run at that property. So knowing what you knew then and frankly what you know now, was uh, closing the ground on the suspect the only option? The only? Yes, sir. Only option. Yes, sir. That was the only option. I'm not afraid. No questions. Um, when you, I guess after making 
contact with Officer Kaysen and coming up with a plan. You, you, you drove your vehicle down that dirt road. Yes, sir. The moment you exited the vehicle, did you uh, remove your duty weapon from its holster? I do not recall the exact moment I um, moved it from the weapon, I, I, um, from the retention holster. It's when I observed the suspect walking and the movement of his hands. So as I observed the discrimination process, I observed that there might be something in his hand, that is when I believe I drew my handgun. But I cannot recall the exact moment I, I, I drew it from watching the body camera. No further questions. Do you have any military service? Yes, sir. I've been in the Army National Guard for 12 years, uh, assigned to a Special Forces Support Group, where we're qualified, uh, conducted counter narcotics operations in other countries. That concludes it. Uh, there are no questions. Um, before we move to executive session, are there any more clarifying questions for anybody? Okay. We'll now move into an executive session where the board will discuss the facts and circumstances around this case uh, to determine if the officer was in compliance with agency policy and training. And obviously our panel is here to weigh in. So clearly the suspect raised all of the information surrounding this incident and the information that the officer is privy to after approaching the suspect who raised this axe, um, doesn't take a lot of experience with, uh, with edge weapons to know that the intention was clear that he was going to throw the knife or throw the edge weapon. I think the officer didn't have a choice but to use deadly force. Uh, this is, in my observations of the facts, a barricaded suspect. However, that does not preclude a police officer with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office from gathering additional information and applying the safety priority matrix to ensure that no other innocent people are injured by the suspect's actions. Additional information has to be gleaned so correct tacti tactical decisions are made. Uh, this situation could have been avoided on multiple, multiple counts, but all of those multiple counts were the actions of the suspect. Uh, when you uh, made the decision to place yourself between innocent people uh, and the uh, uh, and the suspect, I believe that is a perfect application of the safety priority matrix. And uh, it's a tragic incident, but a one that could not have been avoided by. Concur with both Chief Brown and Lieutenant Crawford. I think it's that officer justified in use of force. And Unfortunately, the suspect forced his hand and he took the action he needed to take. I believe when Officer was writing his report uh, in his patrol vehicle and then uh, was alerted that the suspect uh, re entered the property, I think Officer had a duty and a responsibility to put himself between the suspect as well as the complainant, knowing that the complainant uh, was armed with a weapon. Uh, and he clearly stated the fact that he did not want to have a violent confrontation between um, the suspect and his So I think he took the correct approach um, in trying to make contact with the suspect and the suspect's uh, actions uh, as a result of what happened. I agree with all that. Uh, from the training academy, we you talked to us about reactionary gap, but what will we train officers with edge weapons? Yes, sir. So as far as reactionary gap, many years ago it was 21 feet. It's now been pushed up to 30 feet. And, and if you continue to study, it could be 35 feet or more. Can you explain the context of what that means? What that means with the reactionary yeah. gap? So as far as reactionary gap, the time that it would take an ordinary officer to respond to a violent attack by an individual with an edged weapon. Now, that does not take into account a person throwing said edge weapon. It would only be if that person's intentions were to attack you with such as a, a hatchet itself, um, in this instance, uh, or in, in any type of edged weapon. Uh, when you take into account that uh, it would be thrown, 
as this, the video shows that it appeared to be, um, then you're 30 feet, 21 feet, 25 feet, whatever the distance is that you believe um, goes completely out the window. It's no longer a factor um, in our training. It's, uh, we don't teach that because it comes completely out. It takes us outside um, of what is traditionally taught. So, and to put it in perspective, if you think 30 feet, uh, the academy classrooms, the main classrooms downstairs, are somewhere between 35 and 40 feet wide. So if you were to walk in that front door, that's your distance. Um, and that is very close. So um, that, uh, we don't see anything with that. And again, with the, um, he has a duty to protect others. Even if it's protecting the suspect, in this instance, what his intentions were to stop him from going to another location in a violent encounter. Um, and the discrimination process, we always talk about hands and him moving around toward the suspect. There's bush piles and other items around. Um, he's moving quickly. So when you start that discrimination process, things can be missed. Hatchet was originally by his side. So we don't see a, any issues with the uh, what he did from our training aspect. Thanks. Arm range as well. Yes. <coughs> any other discussion on that? Ask if you see if they have any concerns. Please. What did you see? Um, I don't have any concerns. I did want to highlight that. Typically, when an officer approaches a suspect, they don't know their criminal history to the extent that this officer did. And this officer did review that this uh, individual had robberies and had violent felonies in his past while he was doing that report, which is typical, typically not uh, a situation um, that is found. And so I did want to highlight that for the board as well. There's also mention of potential drug use. Correct. You guys see any other policy violations? Yeah. A lot of cameras activated. Okay. And I don't think there's any specific training. Okay. There's no more discussion. We can uh, move into the uh, poll of the board. You got your sheets out. We'll do each one individually. We'll start with uh, Chief Brown. Was the member's use of deadly force justified based on the requirements established in JSO uh, Sheriff's Office policy? Yes. 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 Second question is, did the member commit or potentially commit any other policy violation related to this incident? No. 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 Final question, does the member need any situational training either related to response to resistance, resistance tactics or to any other area in which the member is expected to be proficient? No, 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 no. Okay, the board's recommendation uh, will be provided to the sheriff in the form of a summation. And upon reviewing the summation, the sheriff will ultimately determine the disposition of this case Following the sheriff's decision, the principal officer uh, will be given written notification of the case disposition. And we are adjourned. All right. Pretty simple. Not much else to talk about with this video. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching.